Hi, I want to show you the keys to the greatest unsolved question in mathematics and why a young Indian iPhone programmer may have cracked a problem that has plagued the best minds in mathematics for over a century, leading to bizarre theories from random quantum matrices to superstrings in vain attempts to find a way into the problem. I want to make this an exciting journey like a Chinese puzzle box or a computer game that anyone with a keen mind can find their way through even if you burn out a few circuits along the way. So here goes. The sounds you are hearing are the prime factors of the integers made into chords and harmonics. The primes are effectively the atoms of the number system, having no other factors than themselves in one, while every integer can be written uniquely in terms of its prime factors. Euclid long ago discovered that there were an infinite number of primes using a simple argument. Assume that there are only a finite number of primes, multiply them all together and add one. The new number is bigger than all of them, but is also prime since it leaves a remainder of one on division by all the others. A contradiction. The primes are spread through the integers, but are not evenly distributed. We can see this by writing them out in a spiral, and we see patterns emerging. Some primes come in pairs, as shown here. The twin prime conjecture claims there are an infinite number of these. If we trace the spiral further, we see lots of crisscrossing lines, indicating some quadratic equations have more than their share of primes. In a coup for understanding structures within the primes, in 2004, Terry Tao and Ben Green showed that there were prime arithmetic progressions of arbitrary length among the infinite collection of integers, exemplified by 3, 7 and 11, each differing by 4, shown above. In 2006, Terry Tao and Tamar Ziegler extended this to integer-valued polynomial progressions of arbitrary length. Closing in on the twin prime conjecture, in 2013, Yitang Zhang showed there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by 70 million or less, closing in towards the more difficult twin prime conjecture that there are an infinite number differing by only two, or more generally, any other even number. James Maynard has since then reduced this limit to 600. Neither are the primes randomly distributed, as the right-hand image replacing the primes by a similar density of random numbers shows. Gauss realized that the number of primes up to n follow a logarithmic trajectory, but was unable to prove the prime number theorem himself. We now turn briefly to another number system extending the real number line into the plane of complex numbers. Complex numbers have all the good properties of real numbers and more equations have good solutions. They add component-wise like vectors, but multiply in a twisted way so that their amplitudes multiply, but their angles add together, causing a rotation. Complex numbers are essential in physics to deal with waveforms, and they show us the intriguing fractal properties of complex number iterations, illustrated by Julia and Mandelbrot sets. Most functions we know, such as exponential growth and harmonic oscillation, are governed by power series, as are the diverse phenomena of physics. But the series we shall examine are a type of series developed by Dirichlet and used in number theory. Instead of x to the n, they have 1 over n to the x. Euler then discovered a relationship between the primes and an integer series, the Dirichlet series of the zeta function. We now come to Riemann's paradigm-shifting contribution to the field. Riemann took up Euler's equation connecting the product of the primes and the zeta Dirichlet series and explored the behaviour of these functions in the complex plane. The trouble with Euler's equation is that neither the series nor the product converge in the left-hand part of the plane, as you can see here, so they are only useful for x greater than 1. Riemann's approach was ingenious. He realized that he could smoothly continue zeta into the left half plane using another equation involving the sine function and the gamma function, which is a continuous extension of the factorial, to get psi, a symmetrical function which can extend zeta into the other half plane and has the same zeros as zeta on the line x equals a half. We finally get a really nice portrait of zeta. Riemann discovered that zeta and psi had a string of irregular zeros that seemed to be sitting right on the line x equals a half, and remarked that he had tried to prove this briefly without success, but then went on to develop a whole new arena of prime number research. The symmetry of the zeros clearly manifest in the case of psi, where to be off half they would have to exist in symmetrical pairs, 
hints at a deep underlying unity concerning the primes, from which many important mathematical results would follow, except that RH has persistently resisted attempts to solve it. On the basis of the location of these zeros on x equals a half, Riemann produced an equation for a prime counting function using the y heights of the zeros of zeta. This generated a prime counting function in which the zeros made interfering waves like musical harmonics that eventually added up to the prime staircase. Here is one of the simplest explicit formulae, this one in real time generating a von Mangold prime staircase. Riemann didn't manage to find a way to prove the Riemann hypothesis at the time saying, it is very probable that all the roots are real. Certainly one would wish for a stricter proof here. I have meanwhile temporarily put aside the search for this after some fleeting futile attempts. By real here he means lying on x equals a half. We will never know for sure that Riemann didn't later discover a proof because his housekeeper threw out his notes when he died of tuberculosis at the age of 39. Since then, the Riemann hypothesis has become a nemesis that has brought many great mathematical minds to naught. Here are three comments from famous researchers in the field which sum up the dilemma. Atli Selberg There have probably been very few attempts at proving the Riemann hypothesis because simply no one has ever had any really good idea for how to go about it. Godfrey Hardy the truth is defeated not only all the evidence of the facts and of common sense, but even the mathematical imagination as powerful as that of Gauss. John Littlewood. There is no evidence whatever for it unless one counts it as always nice when any function has only real roots. One should not believe things for which there is no evidence. In the early 20th century, Albert Ingham did establish a key relationship between the zeta zeros and the prime distribution, showing that RH is equivalent to the primes differing from the logarithmic distribution by order n to the power of a half. Many attempts have been made to prove RH by expanding the discussion into other abstract fields. There was great excitement for a time over the relationship between the statistical variation and the separation of the zeros and quantum matrix distributions in situations like the atomic nucleus. As quantum systems have real eigenvalues, it was hoped this would show the zeros or x equals a half, but so far no suitable system has been discovered. There have even been repeated attempts to relate RH to the superstrings some physicists believe are at the source of our fundamental forces, but superstrings are even more uncertain a prospect than the zeta zeros themselves. Another line of inquiry that has proved unsuccessful has been to study the diverse L functions generated by abstract spaces and functions. There are a great variety of these suggesting some general pattern that people hope might prove RH, but there is a catch as we shall see. All these abstract functions have Euler products ultimately defined in terms of our well-known primes, so they're all actually singing the same song. RH has resulted in several claimed proofs which have been treated with scepticism and even ostracism by the mathematical community. Louis de Branges' 124-page proof with generalizations has been sidelined and he has become an isolated figure. Editors of some mathematical journals are besieged with attempted proofs and many mathematicians refuse point blank to even consider reading a purported proof. With this in mind, we now turn to a very short and genius direct proof by Rupun Ghosh. I'm going to examine this and give you a sketch proof of his argument, which you can also find on the archive server and in my review article listed below. The proof concentrates on the Mobius function, which is 1 over zeta. This has two advantages over zeta. Firstly, its coefficients contain prime encoded information directly, unlike the blank ones of the zeta function. We can generate these coefficients by carefully multiplying the two Dirichlet series together, as shown below. Secondly, unlike the zeros, which are hard to define, the Mobius function has divergences at the same points, which are a manifest breakdown of the Dirichlet series. Thus we can show the zeta zeros cannot lie to the right of a half if we can prove the Mobius series are convergent there. The proof also uses the eta function whose series is convergent for x greater than zero and a fractional part integral formula we can see below. The next step in theorem 2 is to develop a formula linking the fractional part integral coefficients of eta to the Mobius series resulting in a very surprising result when these are convolved or multiplied together, term by term, all the way to infinity. 
I call the result prime equanimity. Every integer has the same residue, minus 1, under the convolution between the Mobius prime coefficients and the inverse square wave coefficients of eta's integral formula, regardless of their varied prime factorizations. This suggests the primes are as evenly distributed among the integers as they can be, given they cannot be and are not. This is in itself a strong indication of RH. You can see in this figure the Mobius coefficients in black, the inverse square wave in magenta, the individual products in blue, and the cumulative sum of minus 1 for every integer greater than 1 in red. The next two graphs concern the next step of the proof. The proof then looks at the growth of this convolution for increasing n for a given x. You can see in this figure that this function of both n and x is a slowly growing function which contains a highly varying structure dependent on the primes. Firstly in theorem 3, theorem 2 is applied to generate an inequality ensuring the Mobius series will converge to the right of sigma 0 if the convolved function maximum growth is of the order of sigma naught. There is an ingenious twist to the argument here. If we assume fn is growing only at order sigma 0, inequality 1 forces the left hand side to go to 0 in the limit in the region. Thus neither eta nor zeta as shown on the final limit can have any zeros to the right of sigma 0 because that would cause the first term in the left hand side to become 0 for finite n and cause the expression as a whole to fail to converge to 0. Hence we can conclude that the Mobius series must converge in the region. When we numerically investigate the series, we find the classical argument holds true and numerical convergence of the series for both the LHS and the Mobius series holds to the right of a half. We can also gain insight here about why. It is the divergence of these series at the zeta zeros that directly determine where the zeros are. Theorem 4 now looks at a second inequality that places bounds on the other side, limiting the growth of Fn in relation to convergence of the series. A quick check of all these inequalities for a range of values is shown in this figure, confirming that the LHS over the RHS is less than 1 in each case. As a result of classical integral expressions, we can be confident that they hold for all the values stated. Finally, the proof combines these two-sided constraints to show that a contradiction occurs unless the Mobius series is convergent to the right of a half. The argument goes as follows. Assume convergence occurs only for sigma greater than sigma zero greater than a half. We then use the inequalities of theorem 4 to show fn cannot grow faster than order n to a sigma dash, which is less than sigma naught. But then theorem 3 shows convergence happens to the right of sigma dash, contradicting our assumption and forcing convergence to the right of a half, because sigma dash is less than sigma naught. This is a more general result than RH, because it doesn't just apply to the zeros of zeta, but to all Dirichlet series values of the Mobius series to the right of a half. When we compare zeta's monotone one-type divergence to the left of x equals 1, with eta's convergence down to x equals 0 as a strictly alternating series of 1s and minus 1s, we can see exactly how the Mobius coefficients determine convergence above x equals a half. The clumping of the primes results in clumping of the 1s and minus 1s of the Mobius coefficients, causing zeta-like periods of divergence, interspersed with eta-like periods of convergence. Prime equanimity means the clumping is just sufficient to move convergence from 0 to a half, but no further, hence RH holds. Is this the holy grail or just another hopeful monster? Both myself and my colleague Joel Schiff, who is an expert in the field, consider it to be an ingenious and robust proof. But it still has to be accepted by a mathematical community. Skeptical a problem can never be solved. Nevertheless, it shows how a direct proof can be mounted for the most formidable problem in modern mathematics and provides an inspiring tale that new ideas can come out of left field when we least expect it.